we're making progress. <clears throat> we're not a third of the way through the year, but we're through, uh, let's see, 5 one twelfth of the Bible, 1 eleventh of the Bible, but eh, a lot of content. There are five big books. Yep. Normally, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in and of themselves are long-term projects if you're going to study them. And, uh, but we're not doing a Bible study of that sort. We're really kind of just doing the overview, trying to get help encourage all of us to read through the Bible in a year. Find it uh, hugely beneficial and helpful. Because what it does for me is it puts my mind in the right place daily. You know, if, if work <laughs> this week, if work really messes up with me and it's maybe late afternoon or evening or late evening that I get to it, at least I got to it and, you know, for the hectic day, it kind of helps bring me back to where I'm supposed to be. If it's the morning, it kind of sets the, the direction and the tone to kind of help me have a, a, a mind that is like Christ looking to the world, you know, viewing the world through those glasses. So we're getting through Chronicles, and today we're going to look at the, Moses' final instructions, his final hurrah, as it were, and, and the, the changing of the guard. Uh, you know, today we're going to look at uh, the death of Moses and then the, uh, the, uh, the ascension of Joshua as the leader. You'll make some comments about that. Now, before we get going, Cal, would you open us in prayer? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, for all the, the, the lessons and messages that, that are available to us. And we ask that you bless us now as we read from it, hear from it, and bless Rex as he instructs us. We thank you for Jesus' name. Amen. Thank, thank you. So last week we kind of looked at some of the religious and ceremonial laws. We talked about... There were people excluded from the congregation. We looked at the vow of the Nazarite and the idea of vows of dedication. Um, that was a lot of the requirements. And then we got into a lot of the laws of government. And that's, that's one mindset you always have to keep when you're reading the Old Testament into the New Testament, looking at the church versus Israel. A lot of the laws that we read here concern Israel as a nation, as a theocracy under God, okay? Uh, there are a lot of things that are covered were specific to them as a representative of him to the world. And it was how he established order. Okay? You know, today we have the same thing. God has established government for the welfare of mankind. Okay? And he's appointed rulers, he says, over them. For He says he doesn't wield the sword in vain. They're there to keep order. That's the key. Because God knows the heart of man is wicked. And so a lot of the laws, he talked about how the king, one of the things about the kings is often overlooked, is one of the requirements God said, when, now they were not supposed to have a king. He says, but you're going to get a king. Even though I'm telling you not to get a king, you're going to do it. And when you do it, he, had to, he was to write out a copy of the law himself so he would learn it. And again, that's that picture I told you about. A lot of things you read in the Bible where God is setting down laws, it's not like, oh, that's what God wants. What God is acknowledging is, I know man, I know what he's going to do no matter what I tell him. Okay? Does God want him to have a king? No, because he told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And we saw that. Then the issue with how the courts were up, there were crimes, there was personal injury and personal property rights, there were rights and res responsibilities, there were the issues of injury and redress, credit and collections, and how inheritances were handled. He talked about marriage, divorce, and sexual relationships, and I said that, remember, because we've got some more stuff coming on this week. Why did God talk about the things he talked about? Well, if he didn't talk about those hideous, heinous crimes, the reason he had to talk about them is he knew man. When you read that, you say, oh, that's terrible, that's disgusting, it's revolting. Yeah, but that's what's in the heart of man. And it's even going on today. That's why he warned, he condemned it, okay? So today we got down to a couple more things, and I want to uh, touch on those. First is the idea of uh, general welfare and benevolence. And it's funny because when as we as believers in the church, you mention that word, oftentimes the, uh, the unchurched, the unbelievers get all riled up because they think you only care about one thing. What's that? Money, thank you. In uh, Leviticus 19 and in Leviticus 23, God talks about it. He lays out the benevolence. Uh, first and foremost is always a personal choice. Okay? It was not 
commanded. I look at it this way. God is always putting you to the test. Anything you get, anything happens is a test. How are you going to respond? Are you going to respond as Christ would want you? If God gives you a great blessing, are you going to hoard it to yourself and say, I've stuck in my thumb, I pulled out a plum, and boy, I'm a good boy? Are you going to rely on yourself, look to yourself, and say, ascribe your achievements to yourself? Or are you going to say, this is a blessing of God, what does he expect me to do with it? Okay? Yeah. On the other side, if you find out you're, you're struggling and it's short, are you going to rely on yourself to get yourself out of it, or are you going to look to God to be the provider? Are you going to say, you know what? You know, the Lord helps those who help himself. Well, that's not biblical, but that's what people say. It's a test. It's a personal choice. Um, but um, benevolence, though, God says uh, we should always help those in need. Okay? So God doesn't command it. But he says that's what you ought to be doing. What's that an, what's that an examination of? Self-control. Well, your heart. Your heart. Right? God's not saying you have to do it, but he says you should do it. Right? Now, he told you you're supposed to forgive one another as Christ forgave you. Colossians, right? That's a command. Benevolence is there. Why do we have benevolence? Help others because Jesus said you're always going to have the poor among you. And yet we read in the law that God said, you know what, if you obey me, if you do what you're supposed to be, there'll be no poor among you. You get the implication? You're not going to obey me. You're not going to do what I tell you to do. Therefore, you're going to have the poor among you. Therefore, what? You who are blessed, take care of them. And sometimes, you're all sitting down for this, right? The people who were blessed was because they were obedient to God, and the people who weren't were because they weren't. And what God doesn't want you to have is a high and mighty self-righteous attitude. You know, maybe you are doing what God has told you. Maybe God has blessed you because of that. Well, God says, don't get all full of yourself and think, well, they deserve it. And I think, of, you, know, I, you know, we covered the book of Ruth, and I just love the pictures that we have there with Boaz as a... Everything about Boaz spoke of a man of God, right? Everything spoke of him as a man of God. And yet, in all of his blessings, he never looked down on the needy. I mean, uh, uh, Ruth was not the only one in the field. It's just that Ruth was that special one in the field. And he took care of her. But he, the indication is that's how he took care of everybody to one level. Um, Here's the thing, whatever you have is yours, God said, personal property. It's your choice on what you do with it and how you choose to handle it. But God does hold you responsible for that very thing. And that's just something you want to have in your mind. Right? Because why? Because the heart is inherently wicked. We can become very self-centered, self-serving, very uh, greedy. You know? And fearful. I mean, a lot of greed is, is, is generates from a fear, a scarcity. I have it, I don't want to lose it. Because then what, what are we relying on? Ourselves. Ourselves and our, you know, those who rest on horses and chariots, we're resting on our resources other than God. Because how fast can God take it? Anybody know how fast Job lost it? <laughs> right? And <laughs> Job had a whole lot. And God says, okay, it can go away. He permitted it. Okay? Okay. Um, he says, you got, you got the needy, he says, with humility, regard one another as more important than yourself, Philippians. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but the interests of others. See, that's the high calling of Christ. God says, you're not required to do it, but, but. you need to do it. <laughs> but it's your call. Philippians, have this mind in you, which was in Christ, right? Who, who had greatness, you know, who being God did not consider equality with God something to be held on, but he what? He humbled himself. He came in the form of a man, even and died on a cross. You know, that, that picture, how greatly Christ, God, humbled himself to do what was needed for those in need. That was us. And that's when he talks about benevolence. There's someone with a real need, and you have the means by which to do something. Don't just be self-absorbed. Self Look at them and say, what can I do? Um, In, in, in Deuteronomy 13, when he's talking about the false prophets, God says, I let them come in to test your heart. It's that picture that God, you know, God doesn't need, he knows what's in your heart. When he talks about that, what he's really doing, I believe, is showing us what's in our heart. Because our first inclination is to think of ourselves. Philippians is, you know, that's why Paul has to say, esteem others more important than yourself. Because our natural inclination is to do what? Put who in first place? 
me, myself, and I, right? Top three people in my life, me, myself, and I. So he's just warning us so that we have to be cognizant and thinking. Now, again, I go back to, you know, daily Bible reading. One of the powers that provides is kind of keeping us in that realm so that we don't become self-absorbed, okay? Um, Colossians, he says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Why don't people, why do people hold on to their, their assets? That's greed. They can't let them go. They, you know, how much is enough? Anybody got the answer to that? A little more. <laughs> yeah, that's about the only answer, because Solomon says it's never enough. And he says, you know, you read the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, he's all the time, says, I got to the zenith and it was like empty. I don't care whether it was arts, construction, women, um, gardening, whatever, buildings. I, I did it all. I got all the gold. I got all the women. And it was all like, nah. Because it's all in the heart. Because God's always looking at the heart. Um, one aspect of caring for the poor, the Lord had to do with gleaning and harvesting. Again, we saw that in Ruth. They were supposed to leave the edges. They weren't supposed to go back. If they drop something, they're supposed to leave it. God says, that's my provision. Again, now you're dealing with the sovereignty of God. Like, you drop the, the sheath the, the sheath of, of of wheat, God says, leave it. That's me. I'm providing for the needy. Okay? Now, what I find interesting was, if the needy needed something, what did they have to do? Ruth? What's that? Four-letter word. You can use it in church. Work. Okay? He didn't say just you had to go give it. And that's the other thing. It wasn't forced on anyone. It was to be provided for. So, again, Boaz is a really good example. We'll get back to him. Right? He got, now here's the thing though, on the poor side, there was a limit. In other words, what he didn't let you do, if you were quote unquote poor, was have a Boaz go plant the field, weed the field, grow the field, then have you go in and harvest it. That would be called what? Stealing. Stealing. Mm -hmm. What you could do, you couldn't, you couldn't take, a, you couldn't take a, a sickle and you couldn't cut it down. What you could do is do what Jesus and, and his disciples did, go take the heads of grain and rub them off and you could eat what you needed, okay? You were provided for that. But you weren't allowed to go in and fill up everything. And that's why Boaz told Ruth, take it all, take it all. <laughs> right? But again, it, the idea was protecting the property rights of the individual. You weren't going to do all the work unless and somebody else was going to come and take it. That's not right. But on the other side, you were to leave it so that they could come and get it. Having all sufficiency, right? It's all. Contentment with godliness is great gain. In other words, did you really, you know, if you had a big harvest, you got the field, do you really need those few stalks that got left behind, the few heads of grain or the few grapes on the vine or the few uh, fruit on the tree, do you really need to go get those? Why don't you just let them have them for those who will come by and have a need? Okay. Um, and again, I've mentioned it a couple times. Uh, Boaz is a really good example. You know, he told his guys, drop some, drop some of the barley so that Ruth can pick it up. Because he knew once it dropped, you couldn't pick it back up. Um, he went on there. He went on to some duties and respects. And we, we saw this um, in support uh, in Exodus 21, 22, 23, Leviticus 19, and 20, 24, and then Deuteronomy 5 and 21. He talked a lot about it this week. He talked about parents. He talked about the needy, never forgets them, about your neighbors, and about animals. Now, see, God is adamant. Because there's a picture in creation of, you know, structure. Whether it's civil government, whether it's a family, is the idea, do you honor those who deserve honor by God's declaration? Remember, in the law, he said, you're not to revile the leader of your nation. Why? Yeah, they're God's chosen, they're God's emissary. God, they're working for God. You know, you curse, you know, remember what Jesus told Paul? Saul, when he was Saul, he called him. He said, why are you persecuting the church? No, why are you persecuting me? That's the thing. Um, we're to respect those in authority. And then God knowing the family what is the cornerstone of civilization, the foundation of society. That is why God is adamant to protect it. That's why the evil one works to destroy it. Okay? Uh, he appointed parents as the one responsible with the authority to rule the family. They were his emissaries concerning raising the children. They're the ones with that responsibility, not the village, sorry. Mom and dad own that responsibility and do grandparents. If you read, read the whole law, you'll find out that grandparents have a huge role 
in leading of the kids. Okay? Uh, therefore, God called on the children to do what? Obey, Obey whom? Their parents. Their parents, Ephesians, in the Lord. Okay? Because, again, the, 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 the evil one, the evil, you know, the fallen man will say, well, does that mean everything? They, they really want to twist it. What if the parents are telling the child to sin? No, God says in the Lord. See, as a child grows and he learns the law, if, if mom and dad, mom and dad are going after idols, put yourself in Israel, and the child says that's not what we're supposed to do, actually the child was supposed to rat the parents out. And they were supposed to suffer the consequences. He tells them that. In other words, they weren't just blindly, but they were to follow him in the Lord. But they're to obey the parents, okay? The parents, God had given them the responsibility to train the kids up in the way of the Lord. Think about that. Parents are training the kids up in the way of the Lord. Well, if the parents want to really be effective and really instill that in their kids, what do they need to be doing? They need to be obeying the Lord. They need to be obeying the Lord. You see the model God has? Mom and Dad, you're the one responsible. You know, you can look at the world and say, oh, this world is going to here and there. It's like, well, that goes back to parents at some point. Parents said, you know what, it's easier not to confront. It's, not, it's easier not to address. It's easier to let the kids be kids. Mm -hmm. and then the consequences come back a generation later like where's this world going to well that's what you raised what you raised um, the parents were to train their children to be obedient and they were to enforce the obedience Proverbs Solomon says you know what he says spare the rod and spoil the child he says and if you beat the child he will not die you're talking about corporal punishment I know it's very countercultural, very unwoke today, but that's just what God says. And if you don't think it's real, look at the world and say, hmm, what really happened with Spock? They stopped Who's, huh? We now have the most violent society we have ever had. Yeah. And Spock at the end said, I really messed that one up. Yeah. Because he was, he was uh, eating the fruits of his instructions. A lot of people read that. It's a good picture, right? People went to the world and said, how shall I raise my kids? And they turned away from the Bible. And the Bible had been clear right along. Kids, trust me, kids are kids, right? They have a rebellious bend in them. They're quiet because they're fallen. They take after their parents who are just as fallen. And do they, how, how many of you really kind of like, I can't, I'm so glad the cop pulled me over when I was speeding. <laughs> Think about it. We don't. We're like, Ugh. Right? That's just human nature. Kids don't sit there and revel in it until what? Well, they, they, they come to the consequences, and then what happens years down the road? And, and, I, and I, I've shared, I, I, I'll tell you the story that um, my, my three kids, uh, okay, I give, my daughter one day, because she'd be off, but this may be hyperbole, but she said, when dad was raising us, he was like, steel and now with the grandkids he's like a roasted marshmallow <laughs> which really good but i can tell you this for for all that quote unquote discipline right uh and being who i was and who i am that the kids weren't through high school when they saw people around them that we were acquainted with whether it was relatives or friends where the parents or the mom you know single mom or parents were very lackadaisical very and they noticed where those kids, their, their, their peers were going. And they, they, they of themselves attributed to, well, so-and-so doesn't discipline them at all. And unfortunately, now good, a lot of the kids have really come around because they were in the church and mom and dad were teaching. But they went through 15, 10, 15, 20 years of real trouble in life before it dawned on them what mom and what the Bible, the teachers have been saying was really true. So parents were to be the, the instructors, and the children were to obey. And for this, disobedience is God gave the harshest and strictest penalty, death. He, he lays it out. A child who cursed his parents, a child who uh, struck his parents, a child who was just rebellious. God said to put it to death. It's not a pleasant thought in our world today, but God is very much about it is better for one than for all. And the idea was, how many, how many children, rebellious children, who struck or cursed their parents or just flat out rebellious, if they had been handled with according to God's law, 
How many other kids would have said, I'm going to yell at my parents, I'm going to strike my parents, I'm going to rebel against my parents? Would have come to a screeching halt. Right? Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 6 that obeying one's parents is right and it will be a blessing to the child, but he also warns the fathers not to do what? Be too stern with the child. Yeah, provoke too stern, right? You've got to give them hope. Okay? And that's, what, that's a warning. So... That's on the dad. It's on the parents. Because an overly strict parent, right, that doesn't let the child be who God wants to be, or has this idea, this is who they're supposed to be, you know, you may think they should be, you know, this is their career, and God has gifted them with something totally different, maybe something you have no inclination towards. You know, let them become that, right? It doesn't matter. Are they walking with the Lord is the challenge, right? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing, and it's over in Jeremiah, and I, it, it's, this is extra credit for all the A students. You can go read Jeremiah 35, but there's a, there's a picture there where, where the sons of Jonadab, the sons of Rechab, Rechab wouldn't drink wine because their forefather had said, you're not going to drink wine. And now at the fall of Jerusalem, generations later, after the incoming of the land, you know, they came in the land, they're still not drinking wine, and God says, you know what, because of their faithfulness to their father, and he's talking about the great, 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 great grandfather, the sons had never drank wine in that generation, in that family. And God says, because of their faithfulness to their, the, what their father had said, he goes, they're never going to lack for a man to stand before me forever. That's just an interesting picture of how important God puts obedience to parents. Okay? Um, now, here's the interesting is Jesus, if you know, in Mark, he condemned the Jewish leaders at the time because you're to honor your mother and the father, and they had twisted it or made it so that they could kind of escape that. Okay, there's a point where, and here's the picture, young little junior, right, little Buffy, little, little Buford down here, mom says get to bed, they're supposed to get to bed. Okay, wash your hands, wash your hands. All that. Well, then there's a point where life goes like this, doesn't it? And now the parents are, are elderly, and the parents need love, care, and support. Who gave it to Buford when he was a little kid? Mom and Dad. And God says what? Turn it up. Right. And, but what was going on is they said, you know, I'd love to help you, but everything I've got, I've committed on my death goes to the Lord's so, And if I give it to you, then I'm taken from God. And really what it was was a lie. What they want to do is live in luxury. They didn't want to take any of their resources and give it up. Now, trust me, I'm pretty sure they weren't just doing it to their parents. That was their out from helping the, the needy as well. And God says, you've twisted what God has said, and you're not caring for your parents. So it's, when he says, honor your mother and your father, it doesn't just end with little Buford and Buffy down here. It goes on through life. Never to ignore. I, uh, I hate to tell this story. When I worked for Maricopa County Long-Term Care, uh, we, we were the group that uh, had in-house, um, we would work with people whose moms and dads needed assisted living. And if you were not financially able to handle that, or physically, the county will find a place and put that parent in a care center. But again, well, how does the county get it by low bid? And I'll never forget this, is that the, one of the case workers came in, he was really upset. He said, I'm watching the news last night, and one of my patients children, who he knew because he had to go to the house and do the interviews, he won the lottery and won a couple million dollars. So he called the child and said, I saw you on TV with all that winnings. You can move your, your, your mom or your dad from this base level housing to a, a really nice housing for really, and he goes, are you kidding me? This is my money. Mm -hmm. That's the picture. God condemns it. Just put it out there for you. It is your money. Yeah, exactly. It is your money. And God will hold you to it. Now, God also gave commands for caring for the elderly, the widows, the orphans, the strangers, the deaf, and the blind. All the people who needed help who couldn't do it themselves. Okay? Now, you know what's interesting is in all of this, God never said that thing that we so often says. We often say. That they do it to themselves. He didn't say you sit there and look at the the elderly and the orphan who have no means say, well, what's, you know, what, what did they do that to themselves? And a lot of times the church has, I think, done that. We judge who, who's worthy of help and assistance, and if they didn't do the way we think they should have done what they should have done, 
We're like, Psh, they did that to themselves. And God says, I don't, I don't measure that way because what did you deserve? Death. Hell. Death and hell. So did you put yourself in that straight? Yeah. But did God turn his back on you? That's the picture. The people who need help need it. And then he also condemned. I find it interesting as I, I read this, I look at these laws and I'm like, why, why, why does God have to tell them not to curse the death and not to put a stumbling block before the blind? Why does God have to give that law? Have you got any ideas? Huh? He knows how many is. Which means? Which means that they will do what's bad. Yeah, we look at it and we say, that's hideous. But you know what? He's only given the law because that's what... People do that as a joke. Trip the blind. Oh, isn't that funny, huh? Laugh at somebody else's expense. Take advantage of the, the deaf or the blind. And God says, I'm watching. He talks about the orphan. You take advantage of the orphan or the widow, and they cry out to me. God says, I hear that, and I'm going to move. And that's just a warning. Because what he's working as our heart. We don't want to do that, but guess what we find in our heart is an inclination towards that. We might want to do that, and God says, don't do it. In the Leviticus 19, God gave the command for the people to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus identified this as the second greatest commandment next to love the Lord your God. With all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, right? And this is the, sec and this is the second commandment, it's unlike that too, is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, if you're doing that, then you're not going to worry about all the other things we just talked about. Do you get that picture? If you love God with all your heart, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're doing that, you're not going to do all these other things we've just talked about. When you see a need, a true need, because Thessalonians, Paul said, if a man's not willing to work, he's not going to eat. You know, same thing in the time of Boaz. If, if Ruth and Naomi hadn't gone, if Ruth hadn't gone out to the field, how much would they have to eat? Nothing. And that would have been whose fault? Their own fault. Okay? That's between them and God. Uh, Boaz made it available. That's the picture. Love your neighbor as yourself. He did say if there's an issue, go reprove your neighbor. Think about Paul where he says, you know, don't let the sun go down on your wrath in Ephesians, right? And let no root of bitterness build up in you. Again, God is looking at civil order and being able to work together. Um, the worst thing you can do is let a, 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 an injury of some sort fester. Uh, it's not easy. It's not always pleasant. It's never fun. But you know what? If you got an issue with your brother, you're to do what? Go and make right with your brother. Go, go and address it, right? You know how many times we have issues and it's only because we have two different world points of view, two different understandings of what's being said or why things are being said. And, you know, uh, you know when in, uh, there's a guy, Franklin Covey, in one of his classes, he talks about the idea of seek first to understand. And that's really, really good advice when there's an issue. Because we often, in our human nature, when somebody does something that irritates us, we think they did it, why? To bug us. Huh? To bug us. Yeah, they did it on purpose. And how many times, let me ask you this, how many times have you said or done something and injured somebody completely unintentionally? Right? And when you find out about it, you're like, oh, I didn't mean that. It didn't come out right. I mean, the more every time we open our mouth, we have the potential to say something and, not, and say it in a way that we didn't intend it or mean it or it's taken that way. So he said, always be at, at, at peace with your neighbors. Always address it. Uh, he also talked about treating your animals. And it's just interesting. He said, you know, you're not going to muscle the ox while he eats, which just speaks of caring for. But in Paul, in Corinthians and Timothy, Paul both times says that, that wasn't given for the ox. That was given as an example, he says, of caring for those who do spiritual leadership. Right? Who's going to be take, who's the spiritual leader of Israel? Who are the ones in charge of the religious in, 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 in events in, in Israel? The, the priests. What group, what tribe were they? Levites. The Levites. Levites. They had no inheritance. They were going to do everything for the nation religiously. But they were fully dependent upon everybody being obedient to God and caring for them. That's the picture. God is saying, you know what? The Levites are doing the work because I've called them to it. And we saw what happened when Korah thought he, he should have had it and it wasn't his. Right? God says, we're not, we're not going there. Aaron and Moses are my guys. It's not you. You're done with. Israel, Levites were the ones charged with that. Therefore, they were to be provided for. Paul brought that forward. 
And he said, the one who, 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 who feeds you spiritually should be supported. You know, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches take the attitude like, we well, should be a working pastor. He has a nine to five and he does pastoral. God says he can't do what I'm calling him to do if you, if you make him do that. Okay, then we went on to rules of welfare, warfare. He talked about the siege, you know, how they went to war. And, and I think most important in this section was, in, and this is in Deuteronomy 20, 23, is that before they went into battle, they were to be, the priests were, the Levites were to prepare them for land, okay? They were given the responsibility to instruct and to encourage the people. They're going into battle and they had to let them know, remember this, the battle is not yours. Now this is, there's one of those things where you've got to step back sometimes, and I just think ponder and let God speak. It's like, all right, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know the story. God did it all, right? Get out of the, get, lot, get out, and I'm going to do it. Question, could God have done that with all the Canaanites? Yeah. Yes, he could have. But he being God chose to do what? Use human instruments. He was trying to train man to think like him. Yeah, they, well, they had to trust in God. See, what trust do you have if you stand on the mountain and you watch the fire and brimstone come down? More than likely, you've got fear. Especially if you're, if you're given to the, the uh, false religions of the time of superstition. Because you have a picture of God. God is going to judge these nations and he's going to send the people in, but he wants them to understand, you're doing my work. That's why you're not violating the commandment, thou shalt not murder. Why? Because God is judging these people. And we'll get back to Deuteronomy where God says, I, I kill, I make alive, I destroy, and I, I heal. I'm the one that does it. Nobody else does it. Don't worry about it. God is a big guy. He can handle the criticism. Those who criticize him will answer. Because he's making the right decision. Understanding that the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, all those people had had ample time to repent of their, their wickedness. They didn't do it in a vacuum. Remember there was a guy, Balaam. And before that there was a guy named Abraham. And there was a guy named Melchizedek in their midst that knew of God. But they went another way. And God says, that's enough. Thessalonians, Paul talks about how they, 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 they refused, the Jews were refusing him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles that, and then God, it says that God says that their cup of wrath may be filled. God says, I'm going to let them go, and they're going to get a full measure for their wickedness. And that's what's happened. They're going in the land, and God says, remember, the battle's mine. It's not yours. Um, the God who, quote, brought you out of Egypt. Remember that. Remember the whole story about how he got out of Egypt? Same God's going to fight for you. So what do you have to worry about? Nothing. Why didn't they go in the land 40 years earlier? Because they trusted in themselves. They said, we can't do it. And God says, well, I never asked you to do it. And you're right, you can't do it. Folks, in our life, the battles we have to win, you're not going to win them in your flesh. You know, I, I remember a, a pastor in Michigan, he had a story. He said he was trying to work on his diet. He says he was, he was a vulnerable to the peanut butter sandwich, he called it. And he said, I remember, I still remember him laughing at the story. You know, everything in his mind is like, you don't want this. As he goes to the kitchen, he gets the bread, the peanut butter, makes it. And as he eats it, he goes, it's when the last bite comes, I fully convict myself. <laughs> he says, I can't do it in my flesh. Right? And there's a lot of things in our life we have battles with. Internally, externally, you're not going to win them in yourself. The key is to acknowledge I have a battle. Acknowledge that I'm not winning. And give it to the Lord. And let him win the battle. Okay? And I, the one I like to pick on because I think it's very relevant is, is forgiveness. It's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's, it's so um, prevalent and yet so kind of under the covers in the church a lot of times that, you know, we, we struggle. We, you know, I've heard people, I just can't forgive that. Well, in one level, you're right. I, I get the human level, certain things you cannot forgive. All right? But with God, all things are possible, right? Now, again, if somebody did wicked or evil things, they're, they're responsible to God, not you. Sorry to break the news to you, all right? But it's up to you to acknowledge, I can't win this battle, okay? Whether it's forgiveness or peanut butter sandwiches, 
God's the one that's got to give you the victory. Um, the, P, the priests were to lead the people in the battle with the Ark of the Covenant. They're supposed to say 2,000, um, uh, what do they call them, uh, cubits, right? 3,000 feet basically behind them, three-eighths of a mile. Uh, they weren't to get near the Ark, remember? What happened to Uzziah when he touched it? He was dead. There's a picture there. The picture is who's leading them in the battle? God. That's why the priests are out there in the front. They were the ones leading. Um, there's a great picture, I think, there of spiritual battles, of spiritual leadership. That's the power of, that God has given us spiritual leaders, is to lead, lead the people of God. And to do that, you have to lead from the front. Leadership from the rear is fully, fully ineffective because nobody believes in it. You know, in the services, the military, if you're going into battle... Who needs to be in the front? The leader. Otherwise, nobody's following because leaders lead people and troops follow. And if you're not in front, they can't follow. And if, if, if your spiritual leaders aren't in the front, if they're not leading, then who's going to follow? Nobody. Uh, God instructed him to utterly destroy. This is important because of, and I want to bring this up because so often you hear people condemn God is a God of war, a God of destruction, a God of blood, and he's so wicked. Okay, just understand that none of these people, the Amorites, Canaanites, Berezites, Hittites, Jebusites, any of them, none of them were innocent. All the archaeological digs, everything speaks of immorality of the worst kind, uh, child sacrifices, which God condemns vehemently. That's what they were guilty of. And God says, when you go in the land... These people I'm telling you about, you are to utterly destroy them. Man, woman, and child. God is creator. That's his authority. Okay? Who are you, puny little man, Romans, to challenge God? Men want to sit here and say God was wrong for doing that. I'd say no, God was right because God knows something I don't. He knows everything. And see, God doesn't just look at the today. He looks at the tomorrows. And what will happen, he says, you've got to destroy them because if you don't destroy these people, which they didn't, they will become a snare to you and they will lead you from me, which they did. Now, when they came to farther nations farther away, and we'll get to this, they were, when they attacked a city, they were to offer terms of peace. And if they accepted the terms of peace, then they were to be at peace. They were to become their servants. But don't worry about this because God, as we've already seen, had already had prescribed how they were to be treated. See, our problem is when we look at, at this forced labor in the Bible of this era, we go back to a century and a half, two centuries ago in our own country. And we see the abuse and the degradation of humanity. And God was adamant that when this happened, they were to be treated in the dignity of they're the children. They are in, made in the image of God. And they were to be cared for Okay? That's what they were to be done. So they would make a choice. And if they chose to fight, then God said, destroy all the males. And then he said, everything else is plunder. Women, children, everything else, it's all yours. God's given it to you. At the end, it was a choice that the, the city made. But what would happen with man with his fallenness? He chooses to fight because he doesn't want to submit. And what's interesting is, God was going to provide for them, even in that servitude. Um, he talked about the treatment of animals. We mentioned on that. Uh, the one I thought was interesting was um, when it came to finding birds, because we have a hummingbird's nest in our front yard. We have two little hummingbirds. Little things. Uh, and, and God says, you know, don't bother the mother with her, her little ones. Right? Shows you how, how caring and concerned God is. Right? Again, why did, I always go back to why did God have to say that? Didn't have to. He did. He had he to say it because to. he did it because man does what? <laughs> what he wants. He has a wicked heart. Yeah. He does evil things, <laughs> right? Um, when, it came to, when they went to a siege, they were not to touch the fruit-bearing trees. Again, God's looking at the big picture. Man in his short-sightedness would cut everything down, and God says, well, where, where's your food going to come from? Leave the fruit-bearing trees. You can cut down the pine trees and, and those things to do your siege, but leave the fruit trees. Um, then the next bigger section, 
I'm not going to get moving here, was the uh, responsibilities under the law. And this is where in Leviticus uh, 22, 26, uh, Deuteronomy 12, 22, 28 through 31, we deal with the idea of blessings and cursings. And if you read them, they're extensive. Okay? You know, his, his, Moses' tenure as leader is coming to a close. Uh, they're about to take on the conquest of the land, and God reminds of the importance of obedience to the law. And uh, the message he gives at the end of Deuteronomy is a repeat of the warnings of Leviticus, and they have a few more um, details provided. God is really honing in. He's really pressing down the issue. Obedience is critical. God is not one to marginalize your sin as much as we would like to. And it's interesting because, you know, you've heard this. We, we, have, we have two classifications for lies, right? Don't we? What, kind, what are our classification for lies? White lies and real lies. White lies and real lies, right? And yet, and yet, in the Bible, we'll get to this in Joshua, Rahab, she lied. Yeah. Right? God says, good job. Why? Remember, is it right for me to save life or to to lose life, right? That was her decision. Uh, remember Micah with David when Saul wanted to kill him? She lied. Said, oh, he's sick in bed. And she knew he'd fled, right? Don't look at that as a reason that you can go lie to everybody, okay? But it's there. Uh, the, there's an additional emphasis and in instructions. First thing is God is always holy in every aspect of his being. His people are respect or to reflect that holiness, Okay? We are not to profane his name with our lifestyle. That's what he's saying. Why did Moses not get to enter the promised land? He disobeyed when he did the body. Yeah, what it is, God says, you profane my name before the children of Israel. Okay? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's what he's talking about. Live in a way that they don't look at you and ascribe evil to God. Although the evil one will always do that, even when you're doing right. But the key is to be living in a way, and that's his warning. Okay? Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 through 31. Uh, at the instruction of the Lord, he reviews the blessings and the curses associated with obedience. If they obey the law, if they listen to the Lord, they can count on blessings. And here's the key. If they refuse to obey, if they go their own way, right, they can just as certainly expect God to withdraw all of his blessings and send a corresponding opposite curse. He says, I'm going to bless your fields if you obey me. You disobey me, I'm going to wipe them out. They're going to become like iron. And the clouds will be like bronze. You'll get no rain. And you know what he did? That's what he did. As you read this section, if you read that section, you saw the warnings over and over again. And... There's also the prophetic part that we'll get to is about the captivity. And it was, it's so explicit. And it's exactly what happened because God said, if you do this, I will do that. In blessings and in cursing. And when they disobeyed God, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. So nobody was supposed to be surprised, right? I'll give you a good example. Arizona. You speed in a school zone, and the police officer's there, you're getting what? You're getting a fat ticket. I don't even know what to find. I remember when I started driving in 70, whatever it was, <laughs> five, six, yeah, five probably, some four, somewhere around there. Uh, it was a $500 fine. I'm sure today it's a little bit steeper than that. They don't mess around with it. Well, that's where they're at. You do what you're to do, and you'll be blessed. If you don't, it'll be a curse, Okay. God's faithfulness is reviewed in Deuteronomy 29. In other words, here's the picture. As he goes into the blessings and cursing, he introduces it with, here's what I've done from Egypt to this day. I've cared for you, provided for you. Everything you've done has turned up well for you, okay? Even in your rebellion, though I wanted to destroy you, Moses interceded and, we, and you were kept, and here you are today. You weren't judged with the sins of your parents. They're all dead in the desert. Here you are today. Now, as you're going to go in, I want you to understand, you obey me, you will be blessed. If you do not obey me, this is the curses you'll, you, you can expect from me. And we're going to reestablish his covenant. 
and I, and I caught in this. See, mom and dad back at the Red Sea had said, yeah, we'll commit to the covenant. And then they didn't. And God said, therefore, you'll pay. He's telling the children here, you want to join the covenant? You want to commit to the covenant? If you do, great. If you don't, what, 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 are you, what are options do you have? See, we have that today. See, the offer is out there to anybody and everybody. Do you want to be in a covenant relationship with God? Do you want a God to be your blessing and your covering? You can do that. What do you have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Right? Hebrews, but if you don't take the offer, he says, what other options are there? Go your own way, but what are the consequences? Hell, Hell that's the curse of it. Right? God forces nobody in. He excludes, he keeps nobody out. People are given the choice. And here, at, as they're getting ready, and Moses is giving the blessings and cursings, the people make a choice. They make a choice of commitment as a perpetual covenant between the nation and God. But God says then it comes down to every week, every day, as another child is born, another child grows, they have to make a choice. And if they don't like the rules that God has established, he says then they're out of the, they're out of the covenant. And if for certain things they were to be put to death, other ones are just cut off. They couldn't participate. They can go find their own solution. But it's not going to be with God. And that's the thing today. People don't have to accept Christ. But if they don't, they have really no other option. Now, they can lie to themselves and say they figured it out and they're going to go their own way. But God says it doesn't work. Okay? Now, the, the blessings of God for the people uh, centered on every aspect of their life. It talked, he talks about their family, their health, their government, their military, their financial. Everything, the blessings were all there as were the corresponding curses. And in the one section, he goes through, and he talks about, in your see, the blessings are there. All you got to, the blessings are there. You don't have to do anything to obtain them, but be obedient. In rebellion, God says, I'm going to do this. And if that doesn't get up, I'll do this. He does it four times. He says, he basically turns up the proverbial heat on the people. Why is he doing that? I'm trying to teach them. God is not willing that any should perish. Okay? He turns up the heat hoping, just like Billy, if you do that again, I'm going to swatch you. Billy, if you do that again, I'm going to pass. You know, the idea of it's trying to get them to obey at the least amount of pain mm -hmm. for, them. For, them. for them. That's a blessing. That's how God works, right? God here foretells of the nation's rebellion leading to their Babylonian captivity. That's, that's amazing to me. As you read Moses and Leviticus and Deuteronomy talking about, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen, and it's exactly what happened. Okay? Uh, and in Deuteronomy 30, it's when God says when they're taken captive, uh, when they've been dispersed among the nations, if they will acknowledge their sins of the nation and uh, call to the Lord in repentance and confession, that he's going to turn the blessings right back on. And if you read Daniel, when he has his prophecy of the 70 weeks, what preludes that is he says, reading the book of Jeremiah, seeing the time it comes, 70 years, I went to God in prayer, confessing the sins of my fathers and us. He included himself. But he didn't sweep under the rugs the sins of his predecessors. It had to be acknowledged. We are here because our fathers have sinned and we're sinners too. And that's a beautiful picture for all of us everywhere. We all have tons of sins that we carry as baggage. And God says, Gee, we, what do we have to do to get those resolved? Come, let us reason, Isaiah 1, 18, 16, 18. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though it be as crimson, I'll make them white as wool, right? It's an amazing picture. Though you're really ugly, dirty. What does it take to get them wiped off the book? What does it take? Let us reason together. Acknowledge your sin. Come to God in forgiveness. Come to that the, the uh, throne of grace, the mercy seat, and we'll find what? Mercy. And through Christ. Now, don't go in your own righteousness like, oh, God, I'm all that. But in Christ, can, acknowledging yourself to God and accepting Christ, they're all wiped out. 
Your sins are gone if you're in Christ. And he's called you to holy living. And in here, here's the thing. He says salvation is not hard. Okay? He says, um, if you reject God's word and you think you're saved, God says, I'm going to blot your name out. And four times in the Bible, God talks about blotting out the name of a believer, which to me says, it goes back to God is not willing. You start with your name in the book of life. And it's how you end up where it determines whether your name's blotted out. And he says, if you think you can sin, go on sinning just because you're in the covenant, your name's going to be blotted out. Circumcision is avail nothing. Paul said that. Membership in the body, the, being an Israelite, avails you nothing if you don't have the right relationship to God. And it's the same today. Being the, parent, the children of parents who are Christians or grandparents who are Christians or a pastor's child, uh, it, it avails nothing if, you're, if your sins are still on you. Right? He says you need to be in Christ today is what we would say. And then he says in... Um, in, in Deuteronomy 30, 11, For this is the commandment which I command you today. It is not too mysterious, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven and bring it to us that we may hear of it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it? But the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. It may sound familiar to Romans 10, 6 through 13. Paul says the same thing. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and your heart. What does it take for salvation? It's for the heart to turn to God. And he says, what he's saying is, I've given it to you. It's not a secret. He does say there are secret things and they belong to the Lord. But salvation is an open book. It's available to whom? Everyone. Whosoever. Right? Whoever wants it. In Corinthians, Paul says, when the heart turns to God, he'll find it. The issue is man's rebellious heart. Okay? And again, I won't get into the Calvin Armenian, you know, how does the heart turn? That's up to God. God says it's, it's love that brings men to repentance. Understanding the love of God. God's spirit working. We're given uh, the death of Moses in uh, Deuteronomy 32. He writes a long song before that. In 34, but in 32 he gives a long song about what's going to happen in captivity. And then he dies. Mm -hmm. Seeing the land but not entering. And I find it interesting that even in Moses' death, it's there. You know, the idea of what could have been. And I think that's a warning to believers. Uh, don't live your life uh, haphazardly and get to the end and go, what could have been? God has a call. God has gifted you. Find that gift and use that gift so you don't get at the end and go, what if? What could have been? You know, had he not sinned, would he have led another 40 years and, and led the conquest? Who knows? But he didn't. I get the pictures. I know the types and why he didn't enter and all the other stuff. But... I think that's one interesting thing. At the very end, it says, you get to see the land, but you can't go in because of your sin. That, that, and I think that, you know, Moses recording, Joshua recording the end of the life is, is that regret. And if you remember when he recounted the law to people, how many times he told the nation, it's because of this. You provoked me and I did this. That's regret. Missing opportunities. We're going to fly through in the next few minutes. I'm just going to give you a real... In Joshua 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the readings. Joshua takes command. God says, you're the one. You're going to lead the people. Right? And in Joshua 2, he sends in spies, which is interesting because he sent in two. And the last time when Joshua was a spy, they sent in 12, and only two came back with a good report. Joshua sends in two. They come back with a good report. And they also ran into Rahab, and she's important because she does one. She acknowledges or validates the story of the Red Sea. Everybody had heard in the area 40 years earlier, and they were still talking about what happened to Egypt. Trust me, if a superpower collapses, everybody knows it, and they find out why and how. So she validates it. She says, also, we realize that God was with you. Sounds like Ruth. Your God will be my God. She acknowledges that God is the God of heaven and the only God. And even though she's a prostitute, scratch your head on that one, she goes, I get it. And she protects the spies, and she, she gets the guarantee that her and whoever's in her house would be, per, per, would be saved. And I thought about Lot. Lot tried to get his sons to come in, son-in-laws. They wouldn't come in. Picture here is Rahab. The indication is she got her family in, and they got all saved. Now, who is Rahab? Rahab, I think if you check, um, is Solomon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. 
Solomon married Rahab. They had Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth, right? Ruth is the granddaughter of the grand uh, mother of Jesse, who is I mean the, the the mother of Jesse, who's the grandmother of David, right? The the whole lineage. It's really funny. It's I, I think it's really interesting. They brought back the good report. Uh, in three and four, they prepared to cross the seed. Interestingly, God has him. Uh, the men circumcised because they had not been circumcised in the wilderness. And coincidentally, no coincidence, as they crossed the Jordan, like the Red Sea, the, the uh, priest stepped in, the water stopped, and they crossed on dry ground, which is what they did on the Red Sea. It wasn't mud, it was dry. But they crossed on the 10th day of the first month, which is... The anniversary of leaving Egypt. leaving Egypt, which happened on what celebration? Passover. And on the Passover, on that day, they're supposed to bring the lamb in, and four days later, on the 14th, they celebrate Passover. So they cross the river, the men are circumcised, and then on the 14th day, four days later, they celebrate Passover before they begin the conquest of Jericho. And in there, chapter 5, the end of it, Joshua's hanging out, and there's this guy standing there with a sword. And mm -hmm. Joshua challenges him. Are you for us or the enemy? And God says, take your shoes off. It's holy ground. We have a pre-incarnate picture of Christ. He's the captain of the hosts of the Lord. And that you'll find out as you read chapter 6 and you're reading this week, it's Christ. And he's the one who's going to lead them in the battle. He's the one that's going to give them victory. Okay? We got, a, we got our time, so let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, today and your, your word. And it's a great picture, Lord. Talk to us about, Lord, having a heart of benevolence to those in need. And, Lord, always looking to be able to share with people that the offer of salvation is open to all. They just need to turn and come to you. And in that, Lord, they will find welcoming arms because you're not willing that any should perish. But, Lord, especially this week as we prepare uh, for the upcoming celebrations of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, we pray, Lord, that you might bring people in our paths that we can share Christ with and invite them to come and celebrate these events, these great events in, in history that uh, bring us salvation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.